Good afternoon. Very uh, pleased to welcome you all here today for the story lecture by Professor Richard Lifton. I've known uh, Rick for many years from my days at Stanford. He's uh, an astounding scientist, and it's a, um, a great <coughs> opportunity to bring him here under the auspices of the Storer Lectureship. I think most of you know that the Storer Lectureship uh, was from an endowment set up by Tracy and Ruth Storer in 1960 uh, for the purpose of bringing visitors to the campus. Uh, when it was first set up to bring them here for a month, uh, it's very hard to get people to come for a month anymore. I thought it wouldn't be great to have Rick here for a month. Uh, but now we're pleased to have him here for two days for a talk this afternoon and another talk tomorrow. Uh, what's happening for the very first time today, as far as I know, in the history of this lectureship, uh, is that Tracy Storer is here in the audience with us. Uh, not Tracy Storer, who founded the zoology department, but his nephew, Tracy Storer, who's sitting over here on the left side of the auditorium. And I believe this is the first time that a, a Storer has been to the Storer lecture, so I hope some of you had a chance to say hi to him. So, Professor Lifton is chair and the Sterling Professor of Genetics at Yale University. Uh, he has a long list of honors which are in the program that you picked up on your way in, so I'm not going to take up valuable time uh, reading them all to you other than to uh, hit a couple of the, the main ones. As a member of both the National Academy of Sciences and the Institute of Medicine, uh, investigator of the Howard Hughes Medical Institute, uh, has won numerous awards, including the 2008 Wiley Prize in the Biomedical Sciences, uh, and is a, a rare example of someone who has a first-rate mind in both science, basic science, and in clinical medicine. So, looking forward very much to hearing what you can talk to today. Thank you. Thanks, Ken. It's uh, a real thrill to be here today, uh, only in part to see Ken uh, in his uh, recent role uh, as an administrator uh, 30 years ago at Stanford. Uh, who would have imagined? Uh, so uh, it's, it's great fun to uh, be here, and uh, thanks very much uh, for the invitation. So on such a fine spring day, it's uh, particularly for those of us coming from the Northeast, it's a little harsh to start uh, talking about causes of death in the United States. Uh, but this is uh, part of the topic uh, that I'll be talking about uh, today. Uh, suffice to say, about two and a half million people die in the United States every year, uh, and there is a fairly restricted distribution uh, at the top. Uh, and we know a lot about uh, heart disease, cancer, stroke, asthma, uh, diabetes, pneumonia, Alzheimer's, and so forth. But we largely have descriptive understandings of these diseases and don't really understand in much molecular detail what the primary causes of these disorders actually are in the overwhelming majority of affected individuals. So how can we try to understand uh, uh, disease? So we've had classical approaches uh, that uh, we've uh, taken toward these diseases for hundreds of years, uh, and these include tools of epidemiology, physiology, and pathology, and the, the basic uh, uh, approach has been to try to identify factors that are shared by individuals who share the same disease and to try to work logically toward the molecular understanding of the underlying processes. And there are a number of alternative approaches to this, for example, uh, uh, identifying specific molecules, trying to build up the biology of the molecule, and then ultimately figure out whether that pathway has something to do with disease. Uh, but over the last uh, 15 years, uh, we've really become uh, pretty good at uh, taking a fundamentally different approach to understanding human disease, and this has been the application of uh, genetics. So starting with no understanding other than the idea that there's an inherited contribution to a trait, the tools that have come uh, out of molecular genetics and uh, the Human Genome Project have really afforded us the ability for the first time to start to identify from no other knowledge than there's a genetic contribution, what are the specific genes uh, that contribute to or cause uh, specific diseases? Uh, and then uh, starting with that knowledge to work our way through the biology with a hope that uh, this ought to enable us to do better in the diagnosis and ultimately the treatment of these diseases. Well, this is really revolutionizing uh, all of medicine, just as it has impacted uh, the rest of uh, the life sciences. And what I want to talk about today is uh, uh, some of our work and uh, how it fits in the general field. 
So importantly, the utility of uh, genetics is that it has the capacity to identify pathways uh, that uh, contribute directly to health and disease, and critically, uh, the idea that it will identify new targets and pathways that should enable early diagnosis and therapeutic intervention, realizing, of course, that from the time you identify the target and pathway to when a new t therapy uh, comes on the market may be uh, excruciatingly long and complicated. But nonetheless, we think we do our best when we understand basic biology and medicine. So uh, in human genetics, as in many other fields of uh, genetics, we divide the world uh, uh, artificially into two groups of disorders, the so-called Mendelian traits in which a mutation in a single gene is necessary and sufficient to produce a phenotype. These diseases are typically rare, uh, but our tools have become ever sharper for identifying them. Uh, and importantly, they may identify key pathways uh, that can be exploited for health benefit in the general population. On the other hand, we have the multifactorial traits where there are a, a multiplicity of genetic and environmental factors that combine contribute to the disease phenotype. This is where the bulk of disease burden lies in the general population. The problem uh, here is that at the outset, we don't know how many genes there are. We don't know the magnitude of the effect imparted by any single locus. And so if I came to you uh, five years ago and said, design the right study to uh, identify genes for type 2 diabetes, uh, you would have been hard pressed to come up with a study design that you could rationally defend as being exactly the right approach. Uh, this has changed rapidly in just the last uh, couple of years. So the notion that genes are actually influencing human traits, I think, is nicely captured by this apocryphal family of four pairs of identical twins. And I show this simply to underscore the point that uh, in the absence of genetic variation, we don't sort of look like one another and bear general overall resemblance. We look pretty darn near indistinguishable from uh, one another. And this goes from uh, general body habitus to very specific features, uh, such as uh, the nature of the smile, uh, subtle shading of hair color. Uh, you can see that uh, behavioral traits are dictated by genes as taste in clothing is uh, clearly highly uh, genetic uh, as well. And yet, if we walk around the campus on such a fine day, uh, we don't all look like one another. There's tremendous variation uh, in human phenotypes. This famous photograph by uh, Annie Leibovitz of uh, Willie Shoemaker and Wilt Chamberlain, I think, nicely captures this point. And I think even the most ardent proponent of uh, uh, nurture versus nature would have a hard time convincing us that if Mrs. Chamberlain and Mrs. Shoemaker had exchanged their children at birth, that Willie would have grown up uh, to uh, play center for the Los Angeles Lakers, and Wilt would have gone on to ride winners in the Kentucky Derby. But our expectation is that genes aren't contributing just to gross uh, physical appearances, but to susceptibility to disease as well. Otherwise, how could we explain the paradox of Jim Fix and Winston Churchill? So on the one hand, we have Jim Fix, 5'10", 150 pounds, Churchill, 5'8", 270 on a good day, Fix a marathon runner, Churchill by his own description, slothful and legendary for his gluttony at the dinner table. Uh, Fix made a career as a healthy lifestyle promoter. Uh, Churchill was a smoker of fine cigars. And yet, despite stacking the deck in this extreme fashion, how do we explain the fact that Fix actually died of a heart attack at age 52 while running, I should point out, as a cautionary note to those of us in this age group with such predilections. But Churchill, despite all of these adverse uh, risk factors, lived to the ripe old age of 90. Well, Fix, in Fix's case, there was a particular predisposing factor that we commonly recognize uh, uh, in medicine, and I think many of us can relate to this. He knew that heart disease ran in his family. His father had died of a heart attack at the age of 43, a very young age. Now, until the last uh, 15 to 20 years, we could recognize that diseases ran in families, and we interpreted that to mean that there must be genetic susceptibility to these diseases, but there wasn't much more that we could do. And what's dramatically changed uh, uh, since that time has been uh, the development of uh, tools for doing human genetics. And uh, the cornerstone of this has been the tools coming out of the Human Genome Project, first complete human genetic maps, complete physical maps, and now the uh, complete sequence of, uh, of the human genome. And along with it, recognition that there is common variation uh, in the human genome. Uh, there are catalogs of more than 10 million single base substitutions uh, in the human genome. 
And we recognize that almost all of these are likely to be neutral uh, in uh, uh, evolutionary terms, but they provide spectacular uh, uh, mar genetic markers as they're passed uh, faithfully from generation to generation. And they've permitted us to follow uh, uh, in great detail the segregation of particular chromosome segments through families, and now increasingly chromosome segments through populations. And so as a consequence, if we have a typical autosomal dominant trait segregating in a human uh, pedigree such as this one, affected individuals in the dark symbols, unaffected in the light symbols, we can simply genotype uh, markers distributed across all the chromosomes and compare the inheritance of this autosomal dominant disease to the inheritance of every segment of every chromosome. And if our pedigrees are large enough, uh, we can ach acquire overwhelmingly strong statistical evidence uh, for the precise location of the disease gene. And once we know the chromosomal location, uh, by looking a uh, lookup table, we can go into databases, identify all the genes, sequence all the genes in the interval, and hope that we find situations such as this one, where we find in, in, sorry, in different families, there are independent mutations that are specific for the disease, that co-segregate with the disease in families, uh, and ultimately we can show change the uh, uh, encoded protein and its function in ways that provide, from purely analytic approach, a very convincing evidence that disease genes have been identified. So the power of this uh, has been applied uh, many times over uh, uh, the last uh, 15 years, and uh, as uh, this audience uh, I'm sure well knows, uh, about 2,000 human disease genes have been identified uh, uh, by these approaches, and these are changing our understanding of virtually every area of uh, medicine. One that we've focused particularly on is cardiovascular disease and stroke, the leading cause of death, uh, not just in the United States, uh, but worldwide. Uh, cardiovascular disease and stroke kills 17 million people around the world every year. It's about 30% of all deaths worldwide. Uh, and surprisingly, this uh, proportion is actually increasing rather than decreasing uh, as third world countries uh, start to adop adapt uh, Western lifestyles. There's an additional 20 million uh, people who survive heart attacks and strokes uh, every year with considerable burden and uh, uh, morbidity. Now, we've known from epidemiologic studies that uh, there are risk factors including smoking, high cholesterol levels, high blood pressure, and diabetes. Uh, but we haven't known much uh, about the molecular details of what these actually are caused by. Uh, and when I came out of uh, my background in uh, Drosophila genetics uh, in Dave Hognes's lab, it occurred to me that uh, applying genetic approaches to some of these problems uh, was going to be uh, a productive avenue. And we chose to work on high blood pressure. And the reason we chose it was that it was the least understood of these common cardiovascular risk factors. Despite the fact that it affects a billion people worldwide, it is a major risk factor for death from stroke, heart attack, kidney failure, and heart failure. But its causes have been largely unknown and its treatment suboptimal. And the reasons for this have been that this is a trait that you can only measure in the intact uh, living uh, organism. And you're well familiar, I suspect, with uh, having your blood pressure taken by putting a, a blood pressure cuff on and uh, having a physician or nurse listen to uh, uh, the sounds that uh, result uh, when the cuff is inflated and deflated. Well, the pressure in those uh, arteries is a major risk factor for uh, uh, these cardiovascular outcomes. And so there's been intense interest in what are the causes of high blood pressure. So this is a working model of uh, the regulation of arterial blood pressure devised by Arthur Guyton about 30 years ago, when only about a third of the elements that we now recognize were even known. And I think uh, you'll concede that this is a pretty complicated uh, model, and as a consequence, uh, it's been hotly debated over the years whether this is a primary disease of the brain or of the heart or the kidney or the adrenal gland or the vasculature, and you know you're in trouble when you can't even decide which organ is the cause of the pathology you're trying to study. But this looks like the ideal situation for intervention with, uh, for a genetic approach because we might be able to ask a very simple question. Where in this complex and presumably highly redundant uh, network might we be able to place a single lesion and disrupt the behavior of the entire system? And this, of course, is much like what you would do with a genetic screen in Drosophila, where if, you, if I came to you with a problem in uh, something like body size in flies, 
uh, as a geneticist, you would be unlikely to say, let's take a large population of flies and start looking in the general population and see which alleles might contribute small effects. But instead, you'd say, let's, let's do a mutagenic uh, screen and see what the extreme outliers are that might be attributable to single gene mutations. And these are mutations in uh, the TSC pathway uh, that Tian Xu uh, generated from just such a, a screen. And single gene mutations result in about a threefold difference uh, in larval uh, mass. So we can't do genetic screens in humans. Uh, we can't do mutagenesis in humans, but we can take advantage of the fact that there are 13 billion alleles of the human species on the planet, and with a 3 billion base pair genome, roughly every base whose mutation is compatible with life is likely present uh, somewhere on the planet today. Even rare recessive traits are likely to uh, uh, become known because of the high prevalence of consanguinity in some parts of the world. For example, about 50% uh, uh, of all marriages in Saudi Arabia are between first cousins, and about 1% of all live births have lethal uh, recessive disorders. And even rare diseases in remote locations increasingly come to attention uh, of the general medical community. So this looks like a, a great place to uh, begin, and we thought to try to go after these, uh, if we could find them, single gene disorders that had large effects on blood pressure with the idea that uh, we might get an, a foot in the door with the key pathways that could be manipulated for health benefit in the general population. And the notion that the study of these rare diseases might be of, uh, applicable to the general population, I think, is nicely exemplified uh, by the example of statins in the treatment of, of uh, uh, high cholesterol levels. The knowledge that uh, high cholesterol levels uh, contributed to cardiovascular disease directly came from the study of familial hypercholesterolemia, a disease in its homozygous form that affects one in a million uh, individuals. Uh, and that uh, knowledge led to the recognition that the statins were likely the inhibitors of the rate-limiting enzyme for cholesterol biosynthesis would likely be of clinical benefit. And we now treat tens of millions of Americans with proven benefit uh, uh, to reduce, reduce the risk of cardiovascular disease. And yet we still have a lot of this disease around, so we've got a ways to go. So our thought at the outset was to start with the general distribution of blood pressure in the population, and in this audience, uh, looking at the age distribution, probably about 40% of the population uh, has uh, hypertension. Uh, probably about a third of that, po of that group is actually, actually has uh, blood pressure effectively controlled because our medic medications are just not as effective as they ought to be. So it occurred to us that rather than going after the general hypertensive population, we would go after uh, extreme forms of high blood pressure in the general population. So we've now identified a bunch of genes that uh, cause uh, severe forms of high blood pressure, another suite of genes that cause severe forms of low blood pressure. And the intriguing aspect is that uh, virtually all of these converge on a single final common pathway. They're not littered dis, uh, across the physiologic landscape as in, shown in uh, Guyton's uh, uh, working model, but instead they converge on a final common pathway of how the kidney handles salt. So every day uh, we have about a million of these structures, the nephron of the kidney, and every day these nephrons filter about one and a half kilos or about three pounds of salt and on a typical Western uh, high salt diet, we need to reabsorb all but about a half to 1% of the filtered load to maintain normal salt uh, homeostasis. And the kidney does this by a very elegant uh, uh, and integrated set of ion exchangers, transporters, and ion channels, uh, all of which have their net activity regulated by uh, a, a hormonal cascade, the renin-angiotensin system. So in response to uh, decreased intravascular volume, the aspartoprotease renin is secreted uh, from the kidney. Uh, it causes cleavage, uh, it, it cleaves uh, circulating protein angiotensinogen to form angiotensin 1, which is further processed by angiotensin converting enzyme to the active hormone angiotensin 2. This binds to its uh, uh, receptor in the adrenal glomerulosa to cause increased secretion of the steroid hormone aldosterone. Aldosterone binds to its cognate uh, uh, receptor, a member of the uh, uh, steroid hormone receptor family, uh, and activation of the mineralocorticoid receptor causes increased activity of this uh, sodium channel. And many of the mutations that we've uh, discovered act to alter the activities of uh, this overall pathway.
So I'll give you one example, starting with uh, a woman that I saw uh, when I was a, 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 new, a brand new fellow thinking about this problem. She's a 36-year-old woman with uh, unexplained hypertension that had been diagnosed at the age of 12. Her blood pressure was 210 over 120, extremely high. Uh, normal criteria for hypertension would be 140 over 90. Uh, this is uh, uh, borderline, bordering on medical emergency level of blood pressure. Half her family members had uh, early severe hypertension. Many of them had died from strokes before the age of 45, suggesting that there was something, again, running in the family, but uh, otherwise un undescribed. Uh, physiologic examination demonstrated that she had suppressed levels of uh, renin, this uh, spartal protease, but despite having suppressed levels of renin, she had high levels of the aldosterone, the hormone uh, that is uh, part of the cascade that is normally activated by renin. We ended up doing detailed physiologic investigation of this woman and found that she made high levels of a steroid that normal individuals make in negligible amounts, 18-oxocortisol. Uh, 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 and we also demonstrated physiologically that she had aldosterone secretion that was, secre that was stimulated by ACTH, the hormone that normally tells the adrenal gland to make more of the stress hormone cortisol rather than its usual secretagogue angiotensin II. So a complex uh, set of uh, physiology. But we were able to use this hormone, this, this steroid, as a marker in the kindred, and we found that uh, about half the family members were making exuberant amounts of this abnormal steroid, and that traveled with early severe hypertension in the family. And we were eventually able to genotype, uh, uh, extensively characterize the extended family, uh, and uh, genotype markers across the uh, genome, and demonstrate that there was a shared chromosome segment on human chromosome 8 that was shared by all of the affected members, but none of the unaffected members. And this ultimately led to our identification of the first mutation that affects uh, blood pressure. And this was uh, a very interesting mutation because it was a gene duplication that arose from unequal crossing over between two genes in the segment of chromosome 8. So it turns out that the rate-limiting step for aldosterone biosynthesis is uh, encoded by uh, this gene aldosterone synthase. It lies next door to a, a gene called uh, steroid 11-beta-hydroxylase, which is involved in cortisol biosynthesis. These two genes recently evolved from a common ancestor. They're highly homologous to one another, and they can occasionally recombine with one another. And when this happens, one of the progeny chromosomes contains three genes instead of two, and this chimeric gene fuses regulatory sequences from 11-hydroxylase onto coding sequences from aldosterone synthase. And when you see the structure of this mutation, you understand the biology of how this disease works. This gene will be expressed in the adrenal gland like 11-hydroxylase, but encodes aldosterone synthase enzymatic activity. And the consequence of this mutation is that uh, aldosterone is now expressed in the wrong part of the adrenal gland under control of the wrong hormone. And at the expense of maintaining normal cortisol levels, these patients are always making aldosterone. Aldosterone tells the kidney to hang on to more salt. Water follows to maintain uh, 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 isotonicity of the plasma. Plasma volume goes up. Venous blood return to the heart increases. Cardiac output goes up. And by Ohm's law, blood pressure goes up. This turns off the renin-angiotensin system, but that doesn't turn off aldosterone secretion because aldosterone is now tied to ACTH rather than angiotensin II. So we can explain the physiology and the genetics of these patients on the basis of this mutation. Just downstream from aldosterone is its cognate receptor, and this gets us to a second family that we saw uh, in New York and tracked down their family in Puerto Rico. Uh, this is a family with early severe hypertension with suppressed renin, but almost undetectable levels of aldosterone, so a paradox as to why they have uh, high, high blood pressure. This, again, was a dominant trait. We mapped it and ultimately identified the cause as a single amino acid substitution in the ligand binding domain of the mineralocorticoid receptor, the receptor for aldosterone. So the single amino acid substitution changes a serine in helix 5 to a leucine. And uh, Paul Sigler at Yale had uh, determined the crystal structure of related members of the nuclear hormone receptor family. 
And working with Paul, we built a speculative model as to how this mutation might work and suggested that uh, this leucine created a new van der Waals interaction between helix 5 and helix 3 that would eliminate the requirement for an interaction between aldosterone, the 21-hydroxyl group, and helix 3 since these were separated by just one turn of the alpha helix. So we went back to the lab and uh, through a series of site-directed mutageneses uh, experiments, we're able to demonstrate that this, in fact, was uh, correct, that classes of steroids that normally bind but fail to activate the receptor because they're missing the 21-hydroxyl group are now potent ligands uh, for this receptor. And this has a couple of interesting implications. One is that women harboring these mutations, when they become pregnant and progesterone levels go up a hundredfold in pregnancy, Progesterone doesn't have this 21-hydroxyl group, but now in the presence of this mutation becomes a potent activator of the receptor, and women harboring these mutations uh, develop rip-roaring pregnancy-induced hypertension, and all of the pregnancies in these women have had to be uh, uh, delivered very early, uh, usually uh, around week 30, uh, because of the severe hypertension that they develop. Just downstream from this receptor, is the sodium channel that's activated uh, by the receptor. Uh, and this proves to be the, uh, mutated in another classic disease that uh, we studied called Little Syndrome. Uh, and we showed that this disease is caused by mutations that change the epithelial sodium channel. Uh, and there's a segment in the cytoplasmic tail that is required for its normal clearance from the cell surface by endocytosis through clathrin-coated pits. And mutations that either chop off or modify uh, any of the amino acids in this signal sequence uh, end up uh, preventing the clearance of this channel from the cell surface and entering into the same final common pathway. On the other side of the coin, uh, we went after genes that cause low blood pressure rather than high blood pressure. And we thought this was important, uh, not just to describe uh, both ends of the distribution, but if you wanted to develop uh, new approaches to treatment, it might be good to know uh, genetically what would actually lower blood pressure uh, in humans. And the problem here was that we have hypertension clinics. We don't have uh, low blood pressure clinics. Uh, so how would we find these patients? Well, we went to uh, the pediatric population looking for children uh, with uh, a severe hypotension in the neonatal period. So a typical pre presentation, a two-day-old boy uh, near death with undetectable uh, blood pressure. He had massive salt wasting despite levels, high levels of renin and high levels of aldosterone. He also could not normally secrete potassium, and he had a low serum uh, pH. And his, first, his parents were first cousins, a clue that this was an autosomal recessive disease. So the cause of this disease turns out in its recessive form to be caused by homozygous loss of function mutations in the same channel in which gain of function mutations cause hypertension. Heterozygous mutations in the mineralocorticoid receptor uh, had a similar phenotype. Uh, and all of this tied together rather nicely, we thought, in point making the point that if you increase salt reabsorption in the kidney, blood pressure goes up. If you decrease blood pressure in the kidney, blood pressure goes down. And this got us to thinking about what would be the consequence of mutations elsewhere in this pathway. Uh, and with a little bit of knowledge of human biology, uh, we were able fairly quickly to land on a couple of diseases. One of these is a disease called Gittleman syndrome, and I'll tell you the story of this woman who we saw at Yale. It's a 27-year-old woman who came to the emergency room with paralysis in her first trimester of her first pregnancy. She had paralysis because her serum potassium level was 1.0, with the lower limits of normal being about 3.5 millimolar. She had renal salt wasting, high renin, high aldosterone levels, and several other physiologic abnormalities. And it was a paradox as to what was going on with her. She was seen in the emergency room three times over a period of a week with the same problem. Every time was given potassium and sent home. And finally, on her fourth visit to the emergency room, a diagnosis was made. A psychiatrist saw her, concluded that she had failed to bond with her unborn fetus, and put her in a locked psychiatric facility to protect them uh, from further damage. They thought she was abusing thiazide diuretics, which can present uh, with a picture similar to this. An internist rounding in lieu of the psychiatrist on the weekend, another cautionary note uh, for those thinking about going into medicine, what you're uh, bound to end up doing, uh, thought this was an interesting story, but thought it was somewhat paradoxical that she had been in this locked psychiatric facility for two weeks and yet still had a potassium of 
and suggested that there might be an alternative explanation. So this woman has uh, homozygous loss of function mutations in the target for the commonly used uh, antihypertensive drug hydrochlorothiazide. So uh, in the presence of these homozygous mutations, these patients have salt wasting. They activate the renin angiotensin system. They defend intravascular volume by increasing the activity of this channel at the expense of increased secretion of potassium and hydrogen, resulting in uh, low serum potassium and, uh, low serum, uh, and high serum pH. So uh, again, we can explain the physiology on the basis of uh, the mutation, and this has given us uh, uh, very good starting points for investigating the other physiologies that uh, uh, are found in these patients. And then finally, just upstream is this segment of the nephron called the thick ascending limb of Henle, where 30% of the filtered load of salt is reabsorbed. And if you have mutations in this uh, part of the pathway, uh, you have very severe disease. And these children uh, rarely survive the first uh, decade of life and commonly die in the first weeks of life because they simply can't maintain uh, a blood volume. And by identifying the mutations that cause this trait, called barter syndrome, we've defined the pathway by which salt gets from the lumen of the thick ascending limb back into the bloodstream. And this entails uh, an entry step, an exit step, and the potass interestingly, the potassium that comes into the cell has to be recycled back into the lumen because potassium is rate limiting in the lumen. And as a consequence, uh, uh, this has become a very interesting target for new antihypertensive uh, treatments because this same potassium channel is used in the distal nephron for net potassium secretion. And this has very attractive properties as uh, a new antihypertensive diuretic agent that is actively being pursued in the pharmaceutical industry. So more recently, uh, we've been working on uh, some physiologic paradoxes uh, that uh, were pointed out by genetic studies. So one of these is a paradox in aldosterone action. So if, uh, as it gets warmer here today, if you were to go out and exercise and get a little bit dehydrated, uh, your kidney would sense your hypovolemia, activate the renin angiotensin system, cause you to increase aldosterone secretion, and this would tell your kidney to hang on to salt. Aldosterone is produced in another uh, condition, however, and that is hyperkalemia. If you eat a lot of fruit, uh, your potassium levels uh, go up, and uh, your, this is detected, causing increased secretion of aldosterone. And this, in contrast, tells the kidney to increase potassium secretion. So the question is, when the kidney sees aldosterone, how does it know whether it ought to be reabsorbing salt or secreting potassium? And we only recognize this formally as a real problem worth uh, thinking about with the identification of this disease called pseudohypoaldosteronism type 2. And this disease uh, from 30,000 feet looks like a situation where the kidney no longer can tell the difference and is stuck in a switch state in which it is always reabsorbing salt no matter uh, what net va intravascular volume is and no matter what uh, serum potassium levels are. So these patients have hypertension and high serum potassium levels all the time uh, despite otherwise normal kidney function. And so we were able to eventually identify uh, the causes of this disease and this turned out to be caused by mutation in either of two novel serine threonine kinases called the WINK kinases. Uh, and the mutations in WINK1 that cause this trait are large intronic deletions in the first intron of the gene. And mutations in WINK4 give a very similar phenotype and are any of uh, a number of missense mutations that are highly clustered uh, in an acidic segment of uh, uh, distal to the kinase domain of the protein. So this is a classic situation in human genetics. You have a genotype on one hand, a phenotype on the other, and a black box in between. What are these kinases doing normally, and how do their mutation lead to uh, disease? And so we've done a series of uh, physiologic experiments in vitro, uh, in xenopus oocytes, in, in uh, mammalian epithelia, and finally making animal models. And it turns out that these kinases are concerned with orchestrating the activity of all of the transporters that I've uh, told you about uh, thus far. Uh, they have at least three switch states that we've identified. And there's kind of an equilibrium state in which uh, they inhibit the activities of the sodium chloride co-transporter, the epithelial sodium channel. They inhibit that potassium channel, ROMK. Uh, and they inhibit the paracellular uh, flux of chloride. But in the setting of low intravascular volume, 
uh, they get switched into a state, and this is mimicked by the mutations that uh, uh, exist in human patients that uh, abrogate the inhibition of salt reabsorbing pathways but further inhibit the uh, secretion of potassium, uh, resulting in maximal salt reabsorption and potassium secretion, a condition that would be adaptive in the setting of low serum volume, on the, uh, plasma volume. On the other hand, in the setting of hyperkalemia, through one of the uh, immediate early uh, transcriptional targets of aldosterone uh, called SGK1. Uh, SGK1 phosphorylates WINK4 and puts it into an alternative switch state that inhibits the salt retaining pathways except for those that promote potassium secretion. And so this is a molecule that is involved in regulating the balance between salt reabsorption and potassium secretion. This is interesting in a couple of respects. This, these were previously physiologically unrecognized, but also has interesting implications. It's been known for a long time that potassium, uh, if you give patients potassium, it lowers blood pressure. And this has really been poorly understood as to how this happens. We believe it happens because by giving patients high potassium, you're setting the WINK uh, system into a state that Obligate, uh, obligatorily secretes incre increased potassium levels at the expense of uh, 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 diminishing sodium chloride reabsorption. So potassium is uh, basically phenocopying uh, other pathways that uh, uh, inhibit sodium chloride reabsorption, entering into the same final common pathway. These kinases turn out to be uh, quite interesting because there are four of them uh, in the human and mouse genome. Uh, and uh, we figured out the functions of each of these. Uh, the first two that I told you about regulate the balance between uh, uh, salt and chloride handling in the kidney, but there are two others that, do, that uh, regulate intracellular chloride levels in epithelia and in uh, uh, neurons that express the ionotropic GABA receptor. And these are interesting from two respects. Uh, first, epithelia have to regulate intracellular chloride levels. Uh, and they do this uh, in order to defend themselves against changes in uh, extracellular tonicity. Uh, and they also do this in order to grow. Uh, they have to increase their uh, uh, intracellular chloride levels. And they do this by regulating chloride entry and chloride exit. And it turns out that uh, WINK2 and WINK3 uh, regulate the, uh, uh, this balance by modifying the entry step and the exit step. Chloride comes into cells coupled to the favorable sodium gradient and exit cells coupled to the favorable potassium gradient. And WINK3 in its uh, native state will activate entry and inhibit uh, exit, thereby raising intracellular chloride. If you um, uh, mutate the kinase domain with any of a number of single amino acid substitutions that turn off the kinase function, interestingly, you don't end up with a null mutation. You end up with a situation that uh, reverses the activity of WINK kinase uh, because it recruits phosphatases instead that turn off the entry step and turn on the uh, exit step, which would lower intracellular chloride. Uh, you can see how this would uh, uh, be adaptive in regulating uh, intracellular volume. It's also a, uh, functional in modulating the effect of GABA. As you know, GABA regulates uh, a chloride channel, and, whether gl and, and GABA paradoxically can either be excitatory or inhibitory, depending upon the resting uh, level of intracellular chloride levels. And these WINK kinases are present in uh, cells that express the ionotropic GABA receptor uh, and uh, appear to be regulating this uh, uh, re balance between excitation uh, and inhibition, although a lot of work remains to be done in this regard. So starting with uh, a blank slate, uh, it appears that uh, mutations that uh, increase salt reabsorption by the kidney, uh, raise blood pressure, uh, shown in red. Uh, mutations that lower salt reabsorption by the kidney, lower blood pressure, uh, shown in blue. Uh, and there are diverse effects on other electrolytes, such as potassium, uh, uh, magnesium, and calcium. But if you know the vector of uh, what's happening to sodium, you know what's happening uh, to blood pressure. Uh, and it's uh, as simple as that. Uh, this has suggested uh, a, a number of uh, new approaches to uh, pharmacology that I'll return to subsequently. Uh, but it raises a couple of uh, important questions. So if salt is so important, uh, 
Why aren't the commonly used diuretic agents that are the most commonly prescribed medications more effective? We don't get very far with just giving patients a diuretic uh, uh, agent. And secondly, for 50 years there have been arguments about uh, the epidemiologic relationship of dietary salt and blood pressure, and frankly the uh, relationship is surprisingly weak. And why is that so? Well, once we have these uh, uh, genes in hand, we can start to actually address some of these questions. And I'll give you one example. Uh, this is a family from Lancaster County, Pennsylvania, uh, where Dina Cruz, a fellow uh, in the laboratory, uh, traced uh, 200 descendants of uh, this pair of individuals uh, that are segregating the gene for mutation in the sodium chloride cotransporter, the target for thiazide diuretics. And she showed that there are 26 members of the family who have two mutant copies of the gene, 100 who have one mutant copy, and about 75 who have uh, no mutant copies of the gene. And she contrasted, the, uh, which I thought was quite clever, uh, their dietary salt intake by measuring their 24-hour urinary sodium excretion. So we just had these people all collect 24-hour uh, urine samples and measured uh, their sodium uh, excretion. And at steady state, what you're taking in approximates uh, uh, what you're putting out. So this was a good proxy for their dietary salt intake at steady state. And what she found was that the people who had two mutant copies of the gene were eating a lot more salt than their wild type uh, uh, brothers and sisters. So I'll point out that the individuals who have the lowest blood pressure in this family are the ones who are eating the most salt, which of course is the opposite of what you might have expected the epidemiologic relationship to be, but seems highly adaptive if the primary problem in these patients is that they have a salt wasting problem. The other part that I think is worth noting is that uh, this is a very powerful uh, drive on behavior. So that if I had come to you and said, uh, where do you think we'll find genes that regulate the dietary taste for salt, to, to eat salt, you might not have thought to look in the kidney. But in fact, that's exactly where this, gene, this uh, drive derives from. And it's incredibly potent. So children who have uh, two mutant copies of this gene will tell you that their favorite beverage frequently is pickle juice, that a favorite snack is to cut up a, a lemon, cover it in salt, and eat it whole, rind and all. Uh, and thereby, they're getting both potassium replacement and sodium replacement uh, at the same time. And seems pretty ingenious, but this is all uh, self-selected uh, and is not something that anyone has ever prescribed for them. And most of these patients were just diagnosed uh, uh, without uh, them ever having seen a doctor and telling them that they have a problem. So I think this begins to uh, explain uh, some of these issues. But importantly, when we see uh, patients and give them a, a diuretic agent for treatment of hypertension, we give them a pat on the back and say, by the way, don't eat too much salt. We really haven't been paying attention to the, the fact that the drug we're giving them is actually inducing the behavior that we're trying to persuade them not to uh, engage in. And unless we blunt the dietary drive that we're inducing, we're not going to get very far. And this has impact on how we ought to be treating patients in the general population. So the impact of this work on uh, these rare families has been fairly uh, large. Uh, we've developed simple genetic tests for specific diagnosis. We can do systematic screening in families with dominant traits, and this is very productive. And we can specifically treat what has frequently been very difficult to treat hypertension in these rare families. And this shows one example, uh, an index case with early severe hypertension. First patient genetically uh, identified by uh, genetic screening of this sort. She, uh, this uh, boy had the uh, gene duplication uh, that affects aldosterone synthase uh, gene expression. His family, there were six individuals who had died of uh, strokes at very young ages. Uh, we screened the family, identified 25 additional carriers, uh, most of whom uh, were known to have hypertension, none of whom uh, had been properly diagnosed, uh, despite having been seen in all of the major teaching hospitals in Boston. Uh, and uh, we now recognize that in these families, uh, that uh, the cause of death is cerebral hemorrhage from intracranial aneurysm. And so we now screen these patients uh, at early ages before they have any symptoms for aneurysm. And this woman and her daughter both had uh, intracranial aneurysms that uh, were diagnosed before they had bled, and they were clipped at Yale New Haven Hospital, and uh, they've done very well for the last 10 years now. So 
What I've told you about is our uh, work over the last decade or so uh, on uh, Mendelian traits. And I'm frequently asked, what are you going to do when you run out of all these Mendelian traits? And of course, my first glib answer is we're going to find a lot more and solve those too. And there are two places that I think are likely to uh, be productive. Uh, one are diseases with very high rates of de novo uh, mutation. Uh, and one of these is dominant lethals, where, uh, uh, for example, uh, progeria, uh, where kids have, uh, uh, v almost all of them have uh, de novo mutations, very rarely uh, transmitted. Uh, there are other dominant lethals out there. And also dominant traits with near zero fitness. And I think autism is likely to be a good example of this. Uh, if you think of uh, traits that impair reproductive fitness, autism is probably pretty high on the list. And I think it's relatively likely that we'll find a significant fraction of de novo mutations that likely have fairly large effect in uh, traits like autism. Another place that I think uh, it will be fruitful are, I think there are a lot of Mendelian traits for healthy traits that we simply haven't recognized because they don't show up in the clinic with any problem. You have to go out and try to find them uh, wh where you can. And then finally, uh, later onset disease, uh, I think is another area where we have not systematically looked. We recognize Mendelian traits in kids uh, because pediatricians are, are well versed in this and they see families uh, more frequently. But after uh, uh, families grow up and go their own ways, uh, it, it, we, I think, have not always found, recognized Mendelian traits in older individuals, even though they're there. And I'll give two examples of this, these latter categories. The first of these uh, starts with uh, uh, perhaps the, the male equivalent of uh, the man in the uh, Bruce Willis movie, Unbreakable. Um, so this is the man with the highest bone density on the planet. So he came to medical attention when he suffered a motor vehicle accident in Bridgeport, Connecticut. And the medical resident who saw him that night in uh, uh, the emergency room took cervical spine films, as he was trained to do. Uh, and he said, you know, uh, you don't have any fractures, but I'm very concerned about you because you have the densest bones I have ever seen. And he was concerned that he might have a disease like multiple myeloma. So we referred him to uh, Carl Insonia, an endocrinologist at Yale. And Carl measured his bone density, and his z-score, the number of standard deviations removed from the mean of the population after adjustment for age and gender, was 8. And if you can find a z-table that goes out to 8, that gets you up into the many billions. So this is the guy with the highest bone density on the planet. So Carl called uh, uh, me and said, uh, what do you think you can do with this uh, fellow? Do you think this might be a genetic trait? I said, well, we can't do much with him, but we should study his family. And when we studied his family, it turned out that half of his family was stone cold normal like the general population. But while he still had the highest bone density on the planet, it wasn't by much. The other half of his family members had bone densities that rivaled his. And this turned out to be a simple autosomal dominant trait that we mapped and eventually identified. And it turned out to be a, a single amino acid substitution in the first uh, pro extracellular propeller domain of the LDL receptor-related protein 5. Uh, this position was conserved all the way from its uh, Drosophila uh, um, uh, ortholog up to uh, human, uh, suggesting that it uh, was functionally significant. And we wanna, went on to demonstrate the molecular mechanism. So LRP5 is involved in Wnt signaling uh, as a co-receptor with frizzled. Uh, and Wnt signaling is normally uh, attenuated by inhibition with either DKK or another protein subsequently discovered called sclerostin. And these inhibit Wnt signaling by binding to LRP5 and causing its clearance from the cell surface. Well, in the presence of these single amino acid substitutions in the first propeller domain, DKK and sclerostin can no longer inhibit Wnt signaling. Uh, and the result is this high bone mass phenotype. And the bone is structurally uh, uh, intact uh, and very high integrity. And none of these patients have ever suffered fractures. But the intriguing point of this, I think, from a human genetic standpoint, is if I had come to uh, uh, this uh, group and said, we have what appears to be a gain-of-function mutation in the Wnt signaling pathway, 
What do you think the phenotype is? Those of you who uh, work in developmental biology would have said, well, catastrophic developmental uh, problems because we uh, know about two-headed uh, xenopus uh, that uh, derive from uh, gain-of-function mutations in Wnt signaling. Or if you worked in cancer, you might have said, well, gosh, we know uh, many epithelial cancers uh, have activation of the Wnt signaling pathway. I'd be very concerned about cancer predisposition. But the phenotype of these patients, there's only one complaint that they have, and they have it consistently, and it's they sink when they try to swim because their bone density is so high. <laughs> so from this first patient, once this uh, gene was identified, uh, we've identified, we and others have identified many other uh, f of these families, and their ascertainment tends to be interesting. Uh, one, a physician in Alabama uh, called me shortly after the paper came out and said, I think I've got this. I said, why do you think that? He says, well, I'm 80 years old, I developed arthritis in my hip, and uh, I was taken to the operating room to replace my hip, and I woke up and they hadn't done the operation. And I said, why didn't you do the operation? He said, well, you broke every drill bit in the operating room. Uh, he had such dense bones that they had to uh, contract out to bring in a special drill bits from Switzerland. A second uh, uh, boy uh, fell off a fourth-story balcony. He was not a Davis student. Fell off a fourth-story balcony at a fraternity party, he landed on concrete down below, uh, and walked away with some uh, soft tissue contusions but didn't break anything, and he had this particular mutation. But all of these mutations cluster in this uh, uh, surface of the first propeller domain of uh, LRP5. And, it's a, and, and this is, I think, uh, uh, the ideal situation for translating human genetics into medicine. Uh, we know that these patients from physiologic studies we've done are anabolic. They're making more bone. Um, and, but they're also remodeling bone normally, so they have fantastically high uh, integrity to, their, to the bone that they're making. We don't have any good pharmacologic agents uh, that are anabolic uh, uh, for bone, and as a consequence, uh, there is uh, active development, and in fact, uh, now uh, in, pr in patients are uh, monoclonal antibodies that antagonize uh, either sclerostin or DKK uh, to mimic the effects of these mutations. Uh, and these are highly promising. They're currently under clinical development, but they're having pharmacologic effects, uh, and I think are quite promising as new agents for uh, development of novel approaches to the treatment of osteoporosis. More recently, uh, we encountered this family in uh, Tehran, in Iran, and this endeared us to the State Department greatly as uh, we uh, spent a lot of time in Tehran and ended up having our friends from the FBI visit us when we'd get back to New Haven. Uh, but this was a unique family, uh, and it was unique in that uh, about half of the individuals uh, died of cardiovascular disease from heart attacks before the age of uh, 55. It was the uh, most highly penetrant uh, di disorder of er premature coronary disease, uh, aside from homozygous uh, familial hypercholesterolemia due to mutations in the LDL receptor. And we identified uh, uh, Aryamani in the laboratory, mapped and ultimately identified uh, uh, the gene from this uh, kindred. And it turns out to be a mutation in, uh, uh, paradoxically, a gene related to the one I just told you about. This one is LRP6. And the mutation in this family is uh, single amino acid substitution uh, in the extracellular uh, domain in an LDL uh, receptor-like uh, uh, element. And the intriguing part of uh, uh, the disease in this family is that uh, these patients have many of the, uh, of the uh, predisposing factors to uh, uh, coronary artery disease. So comparing family members with and without uh, the mutation, they have elevations in LDL cholesterol, they have very high triglyceride levels, they have high systolic, blood pressure, uh, high systolic and diastolic blood pressure, they ha uh, have a markedly increased uh, uh, fasting blood glucose and a predisposition to uh, diabetes. Uh, we, this, again, is uh, early days. We know genotype and phenotype. We don't know what's in between. Uh, but the intriguing point is that uh, for years we've recognized that these traits cluster within patients uh, more than expected by chance alone. So if you select patients with diabetes, you get high LDL cholesterol and high systolic blood pressure. If you select patients with hypertension, you get patients with high cholesterol uh, and uh, increased uh, prevalence of diabetes. The underlying mechanisms for this so-called metabolic syndrome have been unknown, and this looks like a form frust uh, for this disease that uh, we're pursuing.
So thinking about uh, other aspects of the future of human genetics, uh, the Mendelian traits obviously are not going to account for most of the disease risk in the population. And this raises, uh, uh, I think, the big question for disease in the population for common disease. And the, that question, uh, I think, boils down as follows. Do common alleles account for common disease? Uh, or do individually rare mutations account for uh, common disease? And the good news is that we've developed uh, tools in the last, uh, over the last several years uh, that enable uh, us to begin to uh, address these questions. We can now genotype uh, millions of SNPs uh, very inexpensively and very rapidly in large cohorts of patients. And we can also begin to resequence genes and hopefully genomes uh, in large uh, cohorts. And this is going to begin solving uh, these questions. The first big success with the genome-wide association uh, approach uh, came from a, a, an astonishingly small study from uh, a brand new assistant professor uh, uh, at Yale, uh, Josephine Ho, uh, who took 100 cases and 50 controls with uh, age-related macular degeneration and genotyped them uh, across the genome on Affymetrix chips. And she found uh, a single SNP that uh, uh, proved to uh, uh, be significant at the genome-wide uh, level that had huge effects on the risk of uh, disease and proved that uh, there are common variations in a gene in the, compl in the alternative complement uh, pathway, complement factor H, uh, that uh, under a dominant model had about 4.5-fold increased risk of disease, and under a recessive model had about 7.5-fold increased risk. Common allele with extremely large effect on disease uh, uh, risk. I'll note that this is a, a, a disease of a very late onset. Uh, patients typically uh, begin having symptoms after age uh, 65. Uh, and suggests that uh, such common alleles could predispose to disease and be kept in the population because they don't impair reproductive fitness, that by the time you're 65, evolution might take a pass and say, go ahead and do whatever you want at this age. I don't care anymore. On the other hand, uh, type 2 diabetes uh, has uh, been, had the study of 32,000 patients, huge study, and eight genes have been identified. And six of these uh, have odds ratios of uh, about 1.15 or less. Uh, very small incremental effects to increase uh, uh, disease risk. These eight genes all have p-values that uh, are off the charts, uh, you know, less than 10 to the minus uh, uh, 15th. Uh, so there's no question that these genes really play a role. Uh, but they only explain about 2.5% of the inter-individual risk, suggesting that these are not going to tell the whole story. And again, consistent with the idea that uh, if evolution gets a whiff of uh, a common allele, it's not going to be allowed to have very large effect or be very common. Uh, we've done uh, uh, some of these studies uh, ourselves, and uh, I won't go through the details except to say uh, uh, we're in the process of identifying uh, genes for a common complication of hypertension called intracranial aneurysm uh, that's a major uh, uh, consequence of high blood pressure. And finally, uh, we're just beginning to uh, tackle the, the question of uh, rare variation contributing to common disease, and I'll give you one example that came out last week. Uh, we took three of the genes where we know that homozygous loss of function mutations cause these severe pediatric disorders of low blood pressure. And uh, we uh, resequenced these genes in 3,000 members of the Framingham Heart Study. And we used uh, comparative genomics, genetics, and biochemistry to whittle through these to identify which of the uh, thousands of uh, individuals with uh, these variants actually had uh, uh, functional mutations in the gene. And it turns out that about 2% of the population are heterozygous for uh, functional mutations. There are 30 different uh, of these mutations in the Framingham cohort. Uh, and all of these are extremely rare, the most common of them had allele frequency of 1 in 2,000. So there were no common variants uh, that had loss of function effects uh, uh, in this population. These actually do affect the traits that we're interested in. They uh, reduce blood pressure at age 40, at age 50, and age 60. At age 60, the effect is about 10 millimeters of mercury, about the same level that you would get from an antihypertensive drug. 
And these mutations actually protect against the diagnosis of hypertension. But these don't have a 10% effect uh, or a 20% effect. These protect uh, uh, about 2.5-fold uh, uh, difference in risk, about 60% protection among mutation carriers compared to uh, non-carriers, supporting the idea that uh, in the combined effects of these rare variations, uh, each with relatively large effect, are contributing to variation in the trait. There are about 100 million people walking around, uh, we would project, uh, uh, with mutation in one of these three genes who's protected from development uh, of hypertension. So um, starting with uh, uh, no great ideas as to where we would find genes for hypertension, I'll just point out that when we started this uh, work, uh, one of our uh, first uh, project reviews from NIH came back with a summary statement that, uh, uh, not to read the whole thing, in essence said, it's obvious that the kidney has nothing to do with hypertension, don't bother. Uh, and we now have evolved, uh, I think, considerably uh, from that uh, starting point. Uh, the Joint National Commission for the Treatment of Hypertension now recognizes that reduction in salt balance is a key goal of treatment. They've evolved further to recognize that we should not be pushing single agents uh, to maximum dose, but instead should be doing early combination treatments such as a diuretic plus inhibitors of uh, the uh, pathways that are activated by diuretics. We think we can explain a substantial fraction of the marked variation in ethnic uh, prevalence of hypertension. Those of us whose ancestors left uh, Africa 100,000 years ago went from a very salt-poor environment to a very salt-rich environment and have had a uh, substantial amount of time to adapt to that environment. Those of us whose ancestors left Africa 200 years ago have not had that same uh, length of time to adapt to a high-salt environment, and we think this has implications for the ethnic variation. And finally, has, this work has identified a number of uh, new targets that are under development uh, in the pharmaceutical and biotechnology uh, 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 industry. So um, what I've tried to show you this afternoon is uh, how uh, applying uh, the elegant tools of genetics that have come out of basic science to uh, medicine uh, has uh, the ability to uh, inform us both for the, diag the diagnosis uh, and ultimately the treatment of uh, common diseases. Thanks very much for your attention. Yes. So, as you probably know, the Wellcome Trust study uh, and their genome-wide associations study uh, identified one particular SNP associated with coronary artery disease. And it was uh, a SNP that was in a gene desert 200 kb away from the, the closest gene. Uh, what do you think is going on there? Yeah, so, <clears throat> so I would say in general, uh, one of the striking findings from the genome-wide association studies have been the general dearth of missense mutations in genes, uh, and that uh, most of the, uh, so, so the first thing you could say was, well, maybe that's just the marker that you happen to have on your chip, and maybe there are better associated markers uh, that actually are inside the gene that actually have something to do with it. But that isn't the case. For most of these associations, you can define a segment of linkage disequilibrium that uh, encompasses the segment that's associated with the disease. And in many cases, those are outside any known genes. And so presumably, these are going to have effects on expression of genes in the vicinity. Uh, but we don't know for sure even what the, tar what the right targets uh, are. And in the case of the chromosome uh, 9 SNP, uh, that actually has come up, uh, interestingly, uh, in our intracranial aneurysm study, and has also come out in the DECODE study of intracranial aneurysm. Uh, so there are very interesting effects on uh, the vascular system that are entirely uh, unknown. Um, the closest genes are also not uh, particularly uh, good, uh, good hints. Uh, they're genes that uh, have not been previously implicated uh, in vascular disease. But I think these are uh, uh, what you actually would hope to find are, are new, new clues that you don't already know about uh, the biology. Uh, so I think those are the most promising. The ones that I find more uh, discouraging are the ones where you say type 2 diabetes, genes that affect uh, uh, insulin secretion by the pancreas. So, well, gosh, that hasn't pushed the ball very far down uh, the field uh, unless it identifies new mechanisms that we might uh, uh, be able to uh, intervene with. 
But I, I think they're most interesting when they identify new biology that we didn't previously uh, understand. Uh, but for all of these, uh, with the very few exceptions like macular degeneration, uh, it's not clear that these will be terribly helpful as diagnostic uh, tools if collectively, and I'll give you one example, there are 13 SNPs that affect cholesterol, common variants. If you take uh, the, the group with the lowest uh, number of those SNPs and the group with the highest number of those SNPs and ask what does that do to their cholesterol, it takes their LDL cholesterol from about 150 milligrams per deciliter to about 170. That's an incredibly small uh, uh, fraction of the variance in an in for an individual. It uh, may have important implications for the population variation, but it's not going to be something that patients or physicians, I think, are likely to be as excited about as, for example, a single uh, heterozygote for mutation in the LDL receptor. And that single gene, present about 1 in 500 in the population, would take your cholesterol from 160 to 300 and has much more important clinical implication. So we're really just getting the, you know, starting to, uh, to drive these around and see what the implications are going to be. And my general sense is, uh, is that if the effects are so incremental, uh, they're not going to be very helpful diagnostically. However, it leaves open the possibility that there might be rare variation in the genes that are implicated that actually will have larger effects and be more relevant to diagnosis and treatment in, in individual patients. Rick, you, you kept talking with WN, WNK4 about switch state. Is the switch state something that's molecularly understood, and is that in itself a possible therapeutic target? It, so it, it is a, p a potential therapeutic target, but there are multiple physiologic effects that we, I don't think we know in, as much about to be confident that we would be doing something beneficial if we pharmacologically manipulate it. These are fairly, br fairly broadly uh, expressed outside the kidney. So unlike, for example, the potassium channel ROMK, where we know that the primary effect of this is to cause massive salt wasting, but does not, patients missing this channel don't get the same level of low serum potassium levels that all of the other diuretics uh, produce. Uh, and, that, and, for that, and they don't have other adverse uh, physiologic effects, and for that reason, we think that's a really good target. The wink kinases are a, a little more, uh, a little harder to be sure that you would be doing something beneficial. And as you know, if you're going to be giving a drug to somebody for life, boy, you really want it to be safe. Witness uh, Vioxx uh, as uh, a real catastrophe. Um, so, but having said that, um, we really are still unsure what the pathway is that goes from aldosterone plus angiotensin II to the switch state that uh, is produced in, in patients. But we know that the single amino acid substitutions at this acidic stretch uh, in WNK4, uh, the mutations that are found in humans, drive that. So our assumption has been that uh, there's something that is liganding that site uh, natively, but we don't yet know uh, what it is. It looks a little bit like a calcium uh, uh, binding site, but we have been unsuccessful in, in convincing ourselves or anybody else that, that uh, that's actually the case. But it's one of those frustrating situations where you have all these mutations that line up on this site and have this effect, so you know there's something, some real biology going on there, but we haven't been able to nail that down yet. Would it be safe to predict that LRP5 would be associated as well with osteoporosis? You gave a very good example with aldosterone synthase where you have gain of function with hypertension, loss of function with hypertension. And there are other examples in structural effects, for example, with the um, um, formation of the calvaria, MSX2 gain of function causes craniosynostosis, loss of function causes underosification of the skull. So if you have yes. this increased bone density... So that's a, 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 that's a great point, and it is in fact uh, true that uh, Matt Warman, uh, now at Children's Hospital in Boston, uh, identified homozygous loss of function mutations in LRP5 as the cause of a severe 
uh, childhood form of osteoporosis. So uh, you have not only the gain of function mutations cause high bone mass, loss of function mutations cause low bone mass, which again tell you that uh, there's something interesting going on uh, in this pathway. One of the points that I think is worth elaborating on is uh, there are clear effects on Wnt signaling, but I, I confess the absence of Wnt, other Wnt-like phenotypes has always left open in my mind the question of whether LRP5 could be partnering with other receptors other than the frizzles in the Wnt signaling pathway to impart its effects, and we really don't know uh, uh, whether that uh, uh, is the case uh, or not. You might recall that uh, LRP5 was implicated in Wnt signaling from a Drosophila uh, mutation originally, uh, and it's not a, I, I consider it an open question as to whether you know, it would make sense to have a co-receptor that potentially could interact with uh, other types of receptors as well. But uh, there's no evidence to that effect yet. Yeah, I, I want to take this opportunity to get your perspective on, on something that, and follow on what you've been talking about, both, both in terms of your career and the yield, and then this last segment about the whole genome scans. And, and that is sort of what is going to be, I'm, I've been trying to think about what the impact is going to be if we, say, three years from now or four years from now, have literally thousands of human disease risk factors. And what is a sort of both the sort of conceptual and operational paradigm and funding paradigm of vis-a-vis -vis lobbies and disease groups, disease institutes? Do you have a sense that, that the, this will get sort of unstable and, and sort of unpredictable about where resources will go and where ideas will go? And, and just, I mean, you're, you're sort of solidly got your feet planted in the success of your own program. But if you look broadly at, at biomedical research, you could see 4,000 new disease risk genes with yep. essentially no analysis, right. just having a huge impact on biomedical research. So, so I think these are the right questions to uh, be asking. My, um, you know, we, we clearly over the next several years are going to be in, you know, team up the horses as best you can and run with this and see what you find with every common disease. Uh, and my suspicion is that, you know, when we went into this, we said, well, maybe there'll be common alleles and maybe there, a lot of these will be, have large effect because of balancing selection, right? So that would be one of the ways that you could imagine uh, common alleles with large effect. We're not seeing a lot of evidence for this. There are a few, few very good examples, but most of these alleles are having pretty small effects. And so if you think about how would you play this out down the road, I think there are a couple uh, of ways. Um, one will be these inevitable efforts to see what you can do diagnostically with them. My sense, candidly, would be these are not going to be terribly useful diagnostically uh, in the main. Uh, physicians and patients are going to be very enthusiastic, in my experience, about uh, doing diagnostic tests when it makes a big difference uh, for, your, for individual risk. If you're talking about whether your cholesterol is going to be 150 or 170, patients and physicians are not going to be interested in using the information for those purposes. But the follow-on to that will be we're going to be resequencing, not we, but the field is going to be resequencing each of these genes to see if there are actually rare mutations in these same genes or in the pathways uh, that are implicated that might have larger effects. So I think that's a natural extension that clearly is going to happen over uh, the next several years. The part that I'm a little uh, less certain about is how well um, some of the new targets will actually translate into therapeutics. In the setting of Mendelian traits, we can actually say, come up with pretty good ideas of what, uh, you know, from, from a homozygous loss of function mutation, that's a, a fir good first approximation proxy for what an antagonist of that uh, gene product would actually do. On the other hand, if you tell me, okay, here's a gene product uh, wh whose variation of, has changes disease risk by 10%, I'm much less confident about what antagonism or agonism of that target would actually do uh, to uh, the intact organism. And it may be that uh, there would be much more pleiotropic effects if you had something that really hit that target hard. And we'll have to solve those on a one-by-one -one, uh, basis. And so I come back to, I think, what uh, you know, was an underlying concern in your, in your question is, how much are we going to spend tracking down uh, uh, targets that uh, may, may not be uh, terribly uh, instructive? And how are we going to allocate uh, resources? 
I think we can say that if you were a good cell biologist or good biochemist, you're going to be in great shape because I can guarantee you that very few of the people doing these genome-wide association studies are going to be in good position to follow the biology of uh, maybe any, but certainly not all of the genes that are implicated by these studies. And I think this is really going to drive a lot of disease-related research. Uh, so I think there will be opportunities. But allocation of resources, you know, I don't know what the NIH budget's going to do. Uh, I, I know we're pretty locked in until 2010 at the earliest, uh, and I'm pretty pessimistic after that as well. But I think some of these will be very useful, but I, I you know, when I, when I see that 32,000 patients explain 2.5 percent of the inter-individual inter risk, I get less enthusiastic about studying the next 100,000 patients to get the next set of eight genes. I wonder, uh, I'm impressed by the fact that not so much, for the, especially for genes of small effect, it's not so much <coughs> that the cell biologist is the first person you call on the phone. It seems to me like you've got to talk to a clinician and physiologist. Or, so I think there's a lot more work up front on those at the human biology stage. It's going to be very hard to do human biology well, on traits that have such subtle effects. So you have to have intermediate phenotypes, hopefully, the ones that have them. But the other thing is, I think there are two sort of unpredictable things that are happening outside the realm of normal practice that are going to have a big impact on this. One is, I don't think the, the I think this whole issue about what the level of effect of these things that come out of the genome scans is going to be revisited. And I think we're going to see a considerable amount of smoke and mirrors about effects of these things. And, and so I, I'm not so sure it's going to be sort of generally agreed that this one thing has a small effect. I think that's the first time around, but in the statistical community, you're starting to see people revisit the estimates of the effects, and some of them are going to go up and down based on shenanigans, and some will go up and down based on real, solid analysis. But then the third thing, which you didn't mention, which often doctors don't mention, but I think is the role of entertainment genetics on the politics and the science of, of genetics. And I think 23andMe is going to feed into people, you know, wanting to know what's going on with this gene or that gene because they have it. And you're quite right, they want to hear about the ones with big effects. But if there's nonsense on the internet about that effect or this effect, it could lead to a ball of, a really big ball. So I can tell you, uh, I was asked to give a presentation at the World Economic Forum this year in Davos, and uh, 23andMe came to the World Economic Forum and invited uh, all of the attendees to uh, give them uh, a, a, a cheek swab sample. And uh, you would be surprised, without knowing anything about what uh, information was going to be uh, captured uh, and given back and what its meaning was, uh, they got uh, about 350 uh, people who just uh, spit in the tube for them uh, and uh, anxiously awaiting uh, uh, results. Uh, it's, uh, I, you're absolutely right. Uh, but that will be, a f I think that will be a, a, f a potentially circumscribed part of the population. And the question is, will this actually take off? And I think there is possibility that that could happen for good or for ill. Yeah. So Great. It's possible that that could lead to uh, increased taxes in support of the NIH, which would be good. I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> and since, since, I think I said instability. since Professor Lifton started with death, we'll end with taxes. And, uh, <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> Please join me in thanking him. I hope, I hope any of you can join us for more for his second seminar, same place, noon tomorrow. Thanks, guys.